The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. What we have here is, uh, well, the reason I did this, I want you to see characteristics of reversionism at different, it's not different stages, it's just different avenues, different 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 ways of looking at something of what the people are experiencing so you can identify it in people's life now how did they get out of reversionism same way you get out of carnality i mean you can be in the last thing and we saw this the other night when we were studying the five the five cycles of divine discipline on the nation of israel the fifth cycle and when they get th when he go when the Leviticus 26 when they get through all through describing and go through the fifth he said you know you don't have to be you don't have to stay there and you don't have to die you know where the end of this is sin unto death will they go to heaven of course they will it's based on their salvation it's not based on this it's based on their salvation but if you get in there there and you don't come out of that you will die the sin unto death. But how do you get out the same way you get out of carnality? You get out of there. And, and, and when we were in Leviticus 26 from about verse 40 on, 40 to 46, he tells you that. They explain it. At the end of the fifth cycle, he explains that to you. You don't have to be there. You don't, this does not have to be your end on earth. But anyhow. So here we are. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to look at 12, 13, and 14 tonight, <coughs> which is called stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart heart that's one of them and the 13th was is a hardened heart and the 14th was is an evil unbelieving heart and these are not necessarily in any order it's just i just ch chose them the way i chose them they they're it's not an order a progression um it's just the way i chose to to do them let's pray I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. Uh, you're, every believer is a priest, 1 Peter 2. And uh, you can't study the Bible in the carnality, nor can you live it. Can't learn it, nor live it. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. You confess it, you're back to spirituality. You're back to restoration to spirituality. And now it's a matter of you walking, walking it out. In Bible study, that would be studying and learning and cycling it by faith. Your personal sin could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue of the bird sins. You confess in silence and privacy prior and prior to study, and you you got it you got it taken care of. So, our Father, we thank you tonight for these to come our way by the automobile and the internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God tonight about reversionism, a title that we've selected to describe the different types of conditions in here under one banner of doctrine that when we say reverse them, we, we include all these 14 different concepts of ideas. Uh, we call them nomenclatures, identifying that you are in reversionism. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Now, <clears throat> the one we're looking at tonight is stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. This has quite a history in the Old Covenant. This, this one has quite a, quite a history. I wrote the, the Greek word for stiff-necked on your paper. You can see where it's, it develops. Um, a stiff neck. That S-K-E-R-O and then the neck. A stiff neck. Um, and then uncircumcised in heart and ears always resisting the Holy Spirit. And you are doing just, at, this, is, uh, this is Stephen in this famous sermon in Acts 7. And Stephen says that to these people. This is strictly, th this has great meaning to Jewish people because the Old Testament is full of examples of stiff-necked, hard, uh, stiff-necked and uncircumcised of ears and heart. And I'll, I'll point some out for you in a moment. But Stephen is where we get this in the New Testament uh, in Acts, the seventh chapter. And when he gets through with it, uh, true to their nature, they stone him to death. That's a tough audience. 
That's a tough congregation. Uh, so, for example, in the book of Exodus, when we're, this was a title that was given to the Exodus generation. In Exodus 33, 3, and the 34th chapter, verse 9, it, English may call it, may call it by a different name. That they, they may call this obstinance. Obstinance. They, they may call this obstinance. Okay? Obstinance. Now, when you, when you go back and you read this, you're going to find here was a group that came out of 400 years of bondage. This is the generation after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Comes through a miraculous, unbelievable experience with how mighty God is in their life. Agreed? Ten plagues in Egypt, right? Uh, the final plague of death. So they survive all of these. They get, get to the Red Sea, right? We know that experience. And God opens the Red Sea up, delivers them. And this group of people, this is this group of people. And they wind up 40 years in the wilderness going in a circle. And that's what reversionism does. Except they're going in a circle backwards. They're in reverse Think how hard it is to drive a car in reverse for 40 years. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. It's exactly what they did. And listen, here's the thing about it. When they were, when their car was in first, second, and third gear, it was headed to the promised land. And as long as that car, as long as that car or life was headed in the directive will of God, even if they were falling in and falling out with favor with God in carnality, their car was moving in the right direction. And then the spy deal came up, right? The spy deal came up, and they, 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 they pushed down on that deal, and now they put their car in reverse, and they went backwards for 40 years. That's reversionism. And they're described in 33, chapters 33 and 34 this way. And listen, what were they traveling towards? A promised land. That's that. Listen, every one of you are. I mean, we live off in the promises of God. When you're living off the promise of God, you're going forward. When you stop living off the promise of God, you're going backwards. You're going in reverse. So we're all doing that. And listen, he even describes it. He describes it for him as a land of what? Milk and honey. Milk and honey. For us, that would probably be milk and cereal or something like that. But milk and honey. Milk, milk and Oreos. Yeah, M milk and Oreos. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, headed towards the promised land, a land flowing of milk and honey. And listen to this. This is kind of interesting. This, it really is worth your read in, in chapter 33 over the holidays. Listen to this. He sends to him, he says to him when he sends him out, listen to, listen to what he says. He says, I will send an angel with you. I will send you an angelic guard on your trip. Because they're going, well, what if, I mean, we're not equipped for warfare. We, we build things. We don't, and, and the people, and then when the spies come back, right? When the spies came back with the report, a land, you know, it's a land flowing with milk. Oh, sure it is, but oh, geez, I mean, who cares? It's, uh, right? God says to Moses, tell him I'll send a military escort guard with him. Angels, invisible military guard. You got to believe it by faith. Can't see it, right? Yep. But I'll send him. I'm going to give him another promise because they're not doing good with the first one. Let's see how I'm going to do it with the next one. So he said, I'm going to send him. I'm going to send an military, military angelic guard with him. Tell him, don't worry. Wow. Well, so he tells him to do that. L listen to what he says in, uh, uh, let me find a verse, like verse three. I will send an angel with you primarily because you are an obstinate people. You don't walk by faith, you walk by sight. Now you can't see it. You're going to have to take this other promise. 
but I'm going to send a military escort with you. Don't worry. You know what that is? You know, you know what Job called that? He called that the hedge, didn't he? he called it the hedge. A hedge around. The devil says, you know, I, 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 I've looked at your guy, Job, but you got a hedge around him. That, 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 that's, a, that's a, I was up at Dave's house not long ago, and he's, he's got two, two great looking dogs. I don't know what kind of dogs those are. Guard dogs of some sort. They're right, right across the street from you. The white ones. Well, I noticed, and and they they they're pretty good sized dogs, and they're pretty. I mean, you can, you can tell when you look over there. They, I, this is my property. I own it. <laughs> you can come on over here if you want to, buddy. I see you looking over here. <laughs> that that's that's the message dog gave me with their eyes. I see you. Come over here. I need I need to eat. So, I mean, they had they had you know some dogs have swag, right? These dogs had it. I mean, and so I would watch them, and they would come down to a certain place in that yard. They'd stop. They'd never move. And I said, boy, those dogs are so well-trained. So Angie one day is out there, and I said, you, uh, you got to come and watch these dogs with me. So I'd go out, and I'd go, eh, 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 you know, because I knew they stopped at a certain place. <laughs> so, you know, and I let them know, I, I, hey, I own this yard. You think you're big? I own this yard. Well, I said to Angie, I said, she said, Dad, I don't know how to do that. I said, yeah, I mean, I have fun with them. She said, that, that, yeah. I, I said, well, look, they'll only come so far in that yard, and, and they're not coming any farther. I mean, they've got them well-trained. I think if I think I could probably, and she said, Dad, that, that's an electric fence that's invisible. <laughs> if those dogs ever jump across that line, You might, if I was you, I wouldn't do that with those dogs. But they had that invisible, they had an invisible fence. I bet if I, where was that when I had kids? I needed that fence. I needed that fence so bad. That remind me, when I was young, we had to walk to school. And one of my friends, every day we walked by this house, the guy owned a German Shepherd. Yeah. He used to guard the property the same way, but they didn't have an electric fence. No, no. He kept the gate clock. Yeah. And, and uh, closed up. Yeah. And he used to tease that dog every morning. I said, one morning you're going to go to school. Yeah. And the gate's going to be open. <laughs> and, and, and Nike's wasn't invented. <laughs> <laughs> well, my smart daughter warned me about that. My smart daughter. And I, I stopped. From that on, I just smiled. Yeah. Hi, ah, boys. But anyhow, the, so G God says, look. I'm, I'm going to put the hedge around you. I'm going to send you with a military guard, and I'm going to do it because you're an obstinate, you're an obstinate people. I mean, you're, you're so wishy-washy. Uh, in chapter 30, not, 34, 9, Moses comes back to the Lord, and, and listen, the Lord says, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to put an angelic guard with you because you're an obstinate people. I'm thinking, it's probably like a lot of parents. Somebody else better handle this kid right now. <laughs> Because I've had it up to here with him. But I don't know the Lord thinks that way. But in, ver in chapter 30, 34, verse 9, Moses appeals to the Lord. He says, oh, please, Lord, come back and be with us. <laughs> These people, I don't know the wire fence, the electric fence is not working. Uh, I, Mo, it's, this is really, I mean, it, it's, of course, I see funny things in most things except my life. <laughs> I'm like you when it comes to that. Hmm. On, on, in my uh, NIV, it says, because uh, you are a stiff-necked people, I might destroy you all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go that far with that. But that's exactly what he said. I'm going to have to put some angelic, I'm going to have the electric fence up. <laughs> I might I slap you right out of the kingdom. <laughs> I know. He does when he does in reversionism, doesn't he? Is an attitude, but anyhow, and then um, in Leviticus, of course, in the twenty-sixth chapter, he calls him. And in, in this one, he calls him stiff-necked and uncircumcised, and and it it shows how difficult it is to come back to just a simple procedure like First John one nine. 
I mean, you know, when you're like carnality, First John 1, 9 is just, mm, thank you, Jesus, ain't it? And, but when you're deep, deep into that, you're stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart, ears, look at hearing and believing, ears and heart. And if you've ever worked with those kind of people, it just seems to be impossible. And pe people just throw up their hands and go, I don't know what else I can do with, the, with this, this son of mine or this daughter of mine or whatever. And it, it's, a, it's a tough place to be. It's a tough place to be to try to, try to love and minister to them. Um, I got Proverbs 29, one down. Let me see why I put it down. Proverbs 29, I put 29, 1. Let me see why I wrote it, because I didn't write it out. Usually I write it out, so it might be saying the same thing of something. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof, that's discipline, will suddenly be broken beyond remedy when the righteous increases the people rejoice. Then he goes on to show the contrast, showing the contrast. Wow. I mean, this is a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Maybe the only, the only, if you don't confess your sin, you're going to go into the sin unto death. And, and the children will, Ill, listen, thundering King James, do you know how the children of Israel that wandered in reverse 40 years? And you know how they're described when they died the sin unto death? You know how these people are described? The, yeah, what was it? Carcasses. The, oh, the King James call it says carcasses. You know what that is? That's roadkill. That's how you describe roadkill. Whoa. Whoa, that's how you described them. That's how you described them, roadkill. After 40 years in the wilderness. Now, so... How easy is it to come out of that? Confess your, confess your sin. In that Leviticus 20 says, says, commit your sin, the sins against me and your unfaithfulness and hostility against me. Become humble, become humble and not stiff-necked. I mean, you're not going to win when you bow, bow your back and neck to God. How, how do you think you're going to, how good is this going to be? And, um, uh, but in Leviticus, he says, you know, confess your sin committed against me, your unfaithfulness and hostility committed against me. Become humble. Become humble. Stop being stiff-necked. And so that's... Now, the 13th nomenclature is hard-hearted. Now, I'll tell you, what's interesting, when you read... Um, and the, the great passage on this in the New Testament describing the Old Testament is Hebrews 3 and 4... Both chapters deal with this subject. I mean, it's an awesome. Someday, it won't be in the near future because I'm doing <laughs> reversionism. Sometime in the near future, I'm going to go in there and we're going to do Hebrews 3 and 4 like we did 8, 9, and 10 and really take a look at the, the working inside the lives of these people. Um, but but th that passage, now, when you take chapter 3, for example, and you break chapter 3 down, into 7 and 19, and you break the fourth chapter because when you talk about the fourth chapter shows you how miserable it's going to be in reversionism, and, the, and that's the third chapter. And the fourth chapter is going to talk about what you're missing is God's rest. You realize that when you are a spiritual person, you can live in God's rest, R-E-S-T, R-E-S-T. I'm wanting to do it. I know. R-E-S-T. Remember <laughs> Respect, you know, it was, I can do it with R-E-S-T. Uh, anyhow, uh, I dare you come back tomorrow night. <laughs> I mean, I'm already, I'm already in Thanksgiving spirit. I mean, I really lay back and take it easy, and here I am. Well, anyhow, chapter 3. In the third chapter, 7 through 19, you want to pay attention. We lo always look for markers. Remember that? Look for the word heart in chapter 3 in verses 7 to 19. It's used four times. It dominates the subject, and it dominates our subject here where he talks about 
your hard heartedness. And he uses the children, the children of wilderness. Can you imagine driving reverse 40 years? I mean, you got this great big window in the front that you never use, and you got this little bitty thing hanging above your head. You know, you got this little bitty, what's that called? Rear view mirror. And you li that's how you, you drive all the way on that. Hardest thing in my life was trying to uh, learn to back up a big trailer. Huh? Oh, are you kidding me? And you can't be a farmer without doing that. So they put me on a tractor at eight, trying to teach me how to back that up. So by the time I got to be a, a, a viable worker, I could actually do that. <laughs> we practice that every, every so often. Back, back it up here, Ronnie. We started with a little cart, and then it got bigger and bigger as I got. Well, anyhow, reverse is what my subject was. Um, the word heart. You want to pay attention when you read the third chapter, 7 through 19. Pay attention to the heart because it dominates it. Then when you get to the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 13, you can see what dominates. Listen, the word rest, if I counted right, is used 10 times. What did they miss in reversion was God's rest. You know, I grew up with there's no rest for the what? Eh? Isn't that the truth? Now, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I grew up with that. My, my people talked that, said that all the time. There's no rest for the weary. No rest for the weary. I'd go out and work a hard day. I'd come in and I'd sleep like a baby. I didn't know what that meant. Huh? But I, when I became adult, I understood it. As a kid, I didn't because I'd work hard. I, I mean, sometimes I, I was so tired when I came out of the field. I didn't want to. I didn't even want to date. You want to go to town and. Cruise, remember we used to cruise? You want to go to town and cruise? Forget it, I'm going to bed. I don't care about nothing like that. That's the farthest thing from my mind. I'm tired. Uh, no rest for the weary. That would sure apply to this group of people, no rest for the weary. He says, he says in Hebrews 3, 7, and 8, he says, today, if you hear his voice, you know how difficult that is? Because we just found that if you, if you one of the things of stiff, stiff neck and what? uncircumcised in what? Ears and heart. See that? It says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you can still hear the voice of God. You know, I, I, old brother farmer would drag me off into all kinds of places trying to tell me how, how good his ministry was. I knew it was good, but he, no, you don't know. So he dragged me along with him. I couldn't say no to Mr. Farmer. He would, he make he'd he'd give me a guilt trip about being in the ministry, so I'd go with him, and and this is what this is the kind of stuff we would find, and he would say, watch for the people because he said there are people in here will not hear the voice of God, they cannot hear it anymore, they their 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 hearts have become hardened, Ron, and you, you can't base your ministry on that group of people, and sometimes it's a pretty large group of people, right, right, I mean. If you've been out in these places, you know that. That's a pretty good group of people. And you know it when they say, I say to them, how many times have you gone through this program? And they go like, well, this is my 10th or 12th time. You know? And they're like, nothing working. And so he would say, but listen, look, for, look in the eyes of the people because positive wish you can see it in their eyes. And boy, can you. Can you ever see it? I was with a couple today. I mean, when they talked about their, their situations in life, it was like a dark cloud went over. The lights were shut down. No music, you know what I mean? But when you brought Jesus and put him on the table with that discussion, they began to light up, and by the end, they were just, I mean, you know what I mean? Those are good signs. It, it, shows, it shows that sometimes living, living it out can be a tough journey. It's not all a bed of roses kind of business, but if you stay faithful... God will always stay faithful. God will always stay faithful for your side. There's one guy always rooting for your side, even in reversionism, and that's God. I mean, we know that from the prodigal son. Come home. Come home, child. Catholics got a great, the Catholics got a great thing up there. They make it, they're making an appeal. I love this. I love this commercial. Make an appeal to come back to the Catholic Church. We Protestants need to do that. 
we need to tell the Caffrey's come back to the church. No, I just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just kidding. <laughs> I want a commercial comes up right behind him. Yes, come back to the church. But that's a great commercial. I like it. That's a that's a smart commercial. That's a smart commercial. We need to be smart in that way. They made a great appeal within their structure. They made a great appeal. Uh, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. See, it's volitional in it. Do not harden your heart. That's volitional. It's not done to you. It's done not by other people. It's done by yourself. Do not harden your own heart. And I, I gave you the words in the Greek, heart and then heart, cardia. As when they provoked me, say he's back to the wilderness, the guy's 40 years in reverse in the car. When they provoked me, as in the day, watch this, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. You, you know what that is? That's faith rest failure. That's what we call the faith cycle failure. Listen, in the faith cycle, here's how this thing started and watch how it ends. Watch this now. I'm going to put the face cycle up there. Here's the face cycle. Hearing, believe, going clockwise. Hearing, believing, applying, and completing. Right? Here's the learning side. And here's the living side. Right? They shut down here. In this part right here, spies go out. They come back. <laughs> right? Uh, we call that secondary negative volition. They knew the truth. God told them what it was going to be. They went out and saw it just like God said it was going to be, right? Saw it just like God said it was going to be. Came back and wouldn't, wouldn't walk it out by faith. They saw one little part of that whole big picture and went negative to the big picture. Yeah, the, the, well, they went in and they saw the cities were fortified. There were a lot of issues, right? But they, they saw the people as big people. Uh, and bigger than God. They ain't nobody bigger than God. I mean, even those two, those two white those two white dogs across the street. All right? Now, you gotta make sure what side God's on though on that street. Yeah. <laughs> sure he's not on the dog side. Uh, so so we got to they to hear. But look, here here's what he says. Look how he says this. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoked me in the day of the trials in the wilderness. And here's what happened. They get, they, they get in, they go from carnality into reversionism. And the first thing we know, they've shut down on that part of it. You shut down on that part of it, you're in deep trouble. And how do I know they did it? Because what? They stiff-necked and become uncircumcised in their ears and their heart. That's that whole system, that believing that hearing and believing is that whole system. You, when you, you, can't, you can't shut down either side of that and have something that's going to work in a positive way in your life. So when they, they look at, in that circle, they shut down on what we call secondary negative volition, application of what God tells you. And when they did that and they went into reversion with them, then they shut out what we call primary negative volition which is receiving the word of God on the front end of it, hearing and believing. I mean, these are dangerous places. I say that to you because you need to know the difference between primary negative volition. Oh, I just don't want to go to church. Oh, I just don't want to listen when I'm at church. Oh, I, I, I you know, I, I don't, you know, it's a, the air stinks or something. What do I know? I, I mean, there are a thousand reasons why you don't want to come. And listen, that's primary negligence. And listen, you're already in a dangerous place when you know in your heart this would be good for you. The, I'm kind of tired. You know, I know that. I've sat, I've sat where you people sat. I know how sometimes you've had a tough day and it's Bible study time. And, but here's what I know, and you'll know it too. If you come with the right attitude, you'll leave refreshed. And when you go home, you'll sleep like a baby. And if you stayed home, you'd have been a baby. <laughs> See? So listen, this, this stuff works. And I, I would come in, I'd drag myself in, and then I was all fired up. I'd go home, and I just I felt refreshed and refueled, just like the Bible says it, because of the Word of God. And a, a sense of, of being able to go beyond some foolishness of I'm tired. Listen, how many times do we push on because we're tired, because we got a job to do? And, uh, you know, it just depends on your attitudes and things. But, but I, I find it refreshing 
I mean, God, God is good to his word. Is he? God is good. God is good all the time. My grandmother's would say, press on. Yeah, press on. Yeah. They used it a little differently, but it was the same thing. Sure, press on. Yeah. That years ago, but so that's what God put all my life. Yeah. So it was Sunday was the only time I got a chance to rest. Yeah. Oh, I woke up from the Sunday morning. You got that right. It was snowed overnight. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd have been to church the way I was to school when it snowed. When when I when I went to college, I didn't go to class one day. We had big storm days either, until after the first semester. My grades come in. My mother came to college. That wasn't a good trip. Also, you want to pay attention. I don't know if I put this on your verse or not on your paper, but you want to you want to be sure you got Acts nineteen, yes. eight through a ten. Yes. Okay, that's that's going to be important because we're going to come back. Listen, in the English, in the English, not necessarily the King James, but in the English Bible, this word idea is going to be transferred over to obstinance. So you may find this word, this word hard-hearted. And, 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 and guess where they're going to find that in Acts 19? In a synagogue, which doesn't surprise us. Uh, and, that, and that's kind of an interesting passage in itself on this subject. Whoa, 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 look at me. At 14. <laughs> I'm at number 14. <laughs> Boy, we're moving on. <laughs> An evil, now this is a tough one, evil, unbelieving heart. An evil, unbelieving heart. This is found in Hebrews, third chapter, verse 12, about the wilderness people. What say? What do you think, in a divine viewpoint, would be the opposite of evil? Divine good. good, divine good, huh? Divine good, and you'd be right. When Jesus does the parable of the four grounds, the four soils, right? There's one that's going to be identified as evil, and the four, of course, the one that's most famous is known as the good ground, isn't it? And and I tell you, that parable is pretty powerful. That little parable is a pretty powerful parable, and it's well worth. And that's Matthew 13. That's that's the one I've committed to memory. And what you want to, it's you know, you always pay attention when Jesus, when any time that Jesus explained a parable. You want to you want to pay attention to his to it, and in chapter thirteen he explains two of them: the tares and the, the ground business. And who do you think he was talking about to his disciples? You know, you know he's, he's got these disciples sitting here, and he talks about the four grounds. It dawned on me one day when I was studying that because every time I did the grounds, I saw, I saw myself. Which, which one of these grounds am I? I mean, I'm sitting out in the congregation reading this, and I'm thinking, uh, I know, I'm in one of those four. I mean, he didn't give five. He didn't give three. He gave four. So he, he, he's, you know, he says there's four, and you're one of these four. Now, which one of these four are you? Well, he's talking to his disciples. I'm thinking, whoa. Now I'm curious, right? I wonder who he's talking to. Hey, aren't we all? When well, I know he couldn't be talking to me, he must be talking to Fran or somebody, right? <laughs> and, and I probably am, to tell you the truth. But uh, so when you look at the disciples, you ha you almost have to tra track them a little while to find it out. But so when you read the parable of the four grounds, the four soils. The, the, they're all described a different way. You want to pay attention to that because you want to be sure you find yourself in one of those and not the one you would like to be. <laughs> we all want a winner, but the one we really are. And then ask yourself, why are you not where you ought to be? And listen to the parable tell you. That'll do you some good homework. That'll do some good homework. But this evil, unbelieving heart we find in Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 12. 
And, and the parable of the grounds, you'll find them too, and you ought to pay attention to it. He says in the third chapter, verse 12 of Hebrews, take care, brethren. Take care. Take care, brethren. You know, we, use, we talk that way to people when we know they're, 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 they're in a dangerous place in their life. They're not there yet. But you could easily be there. How many, time, how many times have we send a warning out to people like, man, I wouldn't do that. Well, I'm, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Mm, I'll tell you. You need to go, go fishing for a day. Take a weekend and just go fish. And then come back and see if that's the decision you want to make. That was Mr. Farmer's advice. He would say, go fishing for a weekend and come back and then make a decision. You'd have to have to have been a better fisherman to change my mind than I was. <laughs> I can tell you that. I had to come back more frustrated than I left. Take care, brethren. That there not be, that there not be in any one of you. Listen to how he said that. If I wrote it right, that there not be in any one of you. Is there? Is that the way yours says, Pam? Are you in Hebrews three twelve? I know you just trust me to put it right. Don't trust my to put it. That wait. That there not be in any one of you. Is that is that the way that says that? That, that n not in any of you? Yeah, none. none of you. Okay. The, the, okay. Okay. We got the idea, I guess. That's kind, that's kind of a lot of stuff right there. Yeah. That none of you, right? That not one of you. I mean, you know what he's doing? Listen, what you're missing here, what he's doing, he's trying to take a self-evaluation. Judge yourself before God has to. Right? Every time we take the Eucharist, he warns you, judge yourself that you be not judged. So the, the issue is, when you hear the word of God, do a self-evaluation. Where, where do you measure up to what the, God says you should measure up to? Right? And, and then make some application of that to your life. There's some changes that need to be made. How can be that? can be done by grace. It doesn't have to be by hard, hard push and shove. Right? I mean, if God says there's some changes ought to be done, it come, it'll come by grace. It don't come by push and shove. And so we ought to consider that. And, and But the, the word I'm after is the word evil. Now, there's different words in the Greek language for evil, and, and they're very important. This one is poneria. And poneria, the reason that word is used is because this is the evil that's promoted directly from the devil to you. This is one-on-one -on -one evil. His name, when he's called the evil one, this is the word that's used, except it's poneros, but same word. So, listen, in reversionism, in reversionism, your pipeline is coming from Satan. Your pipeline into you is not God. He's not, it's not God that's feeding your soul. It is Satan, and what he's feeding is cosmos diabolicus because you've shut this system down where, where it's God pushing divine viewpoint, right? Now, you can reverse this whole thing and get back on this track rather than that track by confessing your sin and humbling yourself and get, get out of, get grace-oriented rather than stiff-necked pushing against it. There is no reason to stay out there in the toolies. There's no reason to, that car, that car is not, it's got a first, second, and third gear and you're not, you, you never used it. You bought a brand new car and you drive it in reverse for 40 years. Be good mileage when you went to sell it, right? Remember in the old day when you could ride your car in reverse and the speedometer would go backwards? You remember that? Or is that a fable? That's a long time ago, Pastor. Was that? That's a long time ago. That did never happen. You told me to pull up my leg. You didn't have to say that. It's been a long time ago. Yeah, but I, in the old day, they used to talk about that, and people would drive your car backwards every once in a while to get the mileage back down. Do I? Well, I'm talking farther back down. I'm talking about Model A, but Model T. I, I don't know, Mike. 
I don't know. But I used to hear people t say that. I don't know. Of the, so just think about 40 years of that. Where I mean, they're back into, you couldn't drive that far, car, car forward. And, <laughs> I mean, how many miles you got in a car? That's a minus 100,000. <laughs> $35. <laughs> See what happens when I get crazy. It, I, I, all of a sudden, I lose my pulpit. Just like that. Boom. Gone. Uh, a good example of what this subject would be would be Cain. Cain and Abel. First um, John 3, 12. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother, his righteous brother. And for what reason? And what reason did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil. See the word? It's Poneros. It's cosmos diabolicus. And his brothers were righteous. That's divine viewpoint system. One was on the evil system of cosmos diabolicus. The other was on a, a righteous system of divine viewpoint. <coughs> See that? And listen, so it goes today, isn't it? So it goes today. I mean, here you are, here you are. It depends. You don't... And then... Uh, Hebrews 3.17 in the King James Bible is where the carcasses are. And I find that, listen, God described that. I mean, that's pitiful. I mean, you talk about a sense of loss of humanity when you describe somebody who dies roadkill. I mean, that's, that's, that's. That's bad. And, and and this um, first John five nineteen. I'll close. This is where you get the evil one. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies. The whole world we're in God, and the rest of the world is in the power of the evil one. Think about that. And you know what's interesting to me? With the power of God in our life, we can we can march right into the devil's concentration camps and rescue whoever God sent us in to get. Think about that. March right in there with the gospel of Jesus Christ and punch him right in the nose. And, and listen, the guardian, the guardian unit that goes with us in there, nobody can mess with us. You can march right in there and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They can respond and you can march right out with them and nobody touch you. That's what this means. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies. And so what are those of God? What is their mission? Ambassadorship to the world. Go ye therefore into all the world, right? Go there, go in and march right in. Well, who's in control of Satan? Big deal. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. March in there and take those people. They're being held captive to the will of Satan. They're held captive to the will of Satan. You have the power, authority to march right into his his headquarters, and take people who have positive volition. Just think about that. And people keep, and the enemy, he runs propaganda and say, you can't come in here, and you better not come in here, and if you come in here, we'll put you in jail, we'll do this and we'll do that. You march right in there and take them. Horton is out there doing it right now. Horton. Out there, and that's exactly what he's doing, because he, he, he walks through doors that no, no man can open and he stays in those because no man can shut them. God opens doors that no man can shut and he shuts doors that no man can open. We need to believe that. And listen, we have the authority of God to be able to do that. You march right out into the world and you take these people out of captivity of the devil and bring them into the kingdom of God. It's called ambassadorship in the Bible. We need to be about that work. I mean, look, we've been talking in James on Sunday about stop talking the game and start walking it. If someone should say, you know, he said, quit that foolishness. You know, walk it out. Listen, we they, they, they're not held captive. 
we, you can go anywhere. They, an open door, you walk through an open door, there's people that need to hear it. It may not be a lot of people. Maybe God sends you in to rescue one person. And you pull that person out of the fire and God turns them into a Billy Sunday. A great evangelist that works the streets every day of his life because he used to be there. God sends you in to get one guy. This is what he did with Paul. Walk, right? What he did with Ron Adam, what he did with you too. We have the authority. We have the authority. We have the authority to do that. You don't know, listen to people that, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Yes, you can. If God opens the door, I can. If God opens the door for Horton, I told him many years ago, when he opens the door, you better preach the gospel or you'll be in the, you'll be in the ministry that has no doors. If he opens the door, you better go through there and you better claim authority over that door. Or you won't be in a ministry very long. So, Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and internet. And I pray, Father, that apart from the foolishness and just having fun, we're excited about what, what, what we teach. We've come to hear the word of God and to enjoy one another's company to be a part of a fellowship in the muck and misery of a world. We sit here in the middle of the muck and mire of the world, happy, lit up for Jesus Christ. We're, we're ambassadors. We look for doors. We look for doors that are open. Open those doors, Father, that a man could shut. May we know it when we see it. May we be bold with it. May we be bold with it. Don't worry about the fire around us. Go on in there and get the, get, get the POWs and pull them out. And I pray we'd be that kind of a church. Wherever we go, wh whatever we do, we do it with authority. We thank you for tonight, for these that have come our way, and we'll come back tomorrow night as we celebrate, Father, a, a thankful heart. Not just a humble one, but a, but a thankful one. As we reassemble tomorrow night, just to tell you we're thankful. You know, we're never about numbers. We're about quality. And so we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.